It's a nice phrase, recording to the cloud. It sounds so ethereal, and uh, it is. Okay, so thanks for dropping in to this meditation whenever you're here, either in this moment or future moments. Um, I'm glad you're here. My name's Jill, Jill Davy, and uh, for these next few weeks, I'm um, staying with a friend here in Toronto. And uh, so tonight's practice and talk is inspired by something that they they shared this morning. Um, so this person is blind. And as they were navigating their way from couch, from counter to couch, um, they said, I'm not knowing where I'm going until I get there. <laughs> and it was true because sometimes, you know, one step to the right, you end up down the hall or, you know, a moment of not paying attention. Um, they can end up in various parts of the of the home. So uh, even though it was a, a relatively short navigation, it was you know a, a really true statement, and and it struck me at uh, this uh, not knowing where I'm going until I get there. And I thought there may be a lot more awake and peaceful people if we all awoke to each moment and each day in that way of not knowing really where we're going until we get there um you know how how might we be served by that kind of attention that kind of really awakefulness paying attentionness because so much of the time we assume we know where we're heading we think we know how the day is going to unfold or the week or our lives or the next few years where we're headed and what how we want to what we want to become uh and a lot of people put a lot of energy into that kind of imagining really imagining what is coming and um but if we really paid attention to how things are, always changing, uncontrollable, impermanent, beyond my individual capacity to control all the variables, certainly, then we would know that anything can be. We don't know where we're going to end up in the next moment. And I find it a helpful way to pay attention to really wake up well, how is this and what's really going on um so the only thing that maybe in this in this topic that's helpful to know is that we don't know <laughs> so there's a knowing in that the knowing that we don't really know and and uh to accept that can really free up a lot of energy and free up our hearts and minds from clinging, from imagining and clinging to some expected outcome. In my wanderings today, I don't know how I even got there, but I found this incredible um, blog, uh, a writer, um, a wonderful site, it's called The Marginalian. I, I'm not sure what that title means, Marginalian. Um, I'll put the link for it down below. And uh, it's written by um, uh, an author, Bulgarian-born, um, American-based essayist and author and poet and writer um, called Maria Popo Popova. Popova, yes. And uh, it's, it's an incredible rabbit hole, <laughs> just because within any blog as as is the nature of the blog they put links to other oh you you know it excellent um someone's just sharing in the chat that they're aware of it it was my first foray into it today and uh 
but within any blog, they put links to other pieces they've written. And so you just end up, whoa, whoa, whoa that look, and off and off and off. Um, but she's an amazing, she reads and reads and then um, writes these wonderful pieces that are very inspiring and insightful. So in particular, I was drawn to this one book that she was writing about and did an interview with the author, et cetera, um, that sounds like an amazing book. Well, actually, this blog author, Maria Popova, um, calls this book, she says it's an immeasurably wonderful book, and she reads a lot of books. She said, it's among the most interesting I've ever read, a provocative exploration of how powerfully our experience of reality, in quotes, is framed by the limitations of our attention and sensory awareness. And so the name of this book is um, called On Looking, 11 Walks with Expert Eyes. And it's written by a cognitive uh, scientist named Alexandra Horowitz. I'll put the link to her book um, down below as well. So yeah, this, this author, Alexandra Horowitz, um, I don't know how many walks she went on with people, but she ends up writing about 11 of these experiences in the book. I don't know how she picked 11 because I'm sure they were all fascinating. And so she invited people with a different life experience, a different lens, a different view, different um, interests and perceptions to walk the same block, city block with her. And so it's, it's um, 11 walks with expert eyes. Uh, and so some of them, I haven't read the book yet, but I, I hope to, um, an artist, a geologist, a dog, yay, uh, a blind person, and a toddler are some of them. And you can just imagine how different that same city block with those different life experiences and lenses and curiosities revealed things that she could never have imagined were there in that same city block until she saw it through someone else's eyes. Of course, this I'm using a lot of language of seeing, and um, the book is called On Looking, but it could be about hearing, about touch, about smelling. Um, yeah, so, and in fact, one of the people that she walked with in this block was, um, was a blind person. I'm not sure if they're in the book, some of the experiences didn't get into the book. Um, I'm not sure about that one, but she talked about how that person invites um, people to go on trips with her, vacations or journeys, and describe what they're seeing this blind person and get, you know, and how the how that um, awakens in the sighted person a whole different experience of seeing, a whole different experience of paying attention because they're really paying attention in order to describe and, and uh, bring that experience to the unsighted person. And, and that's just, wow, that's so beautiful. And so is that something we can accompany ourselves in this life? A rhetorical question. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> so how can we walk beside ourselves and accompany ourselves in this different way of waking up and paying attention to what's happening right now, right under our noses, so to speak? Um, Yeah, so she um, she talks about the incompleteness of how we 
are experiencing our conventional notion of what we call reality, you know, and, and part of this is just a survival mechanism, how our attention has been cultivated to filter out so much of what's going on around us because all of our six sense doors are receiving a infinite amount of information in every moment. And in order to function well, some report, some folks um, on the autistic spectrum report that they don't, some folks don't have that kind of a filter and they're receiving so much information all the time from their sense doors um that it it becomes paralyzing immobilizing overwhelming i guess is a better word overwhelming um you know and so there is something to be said for being able to filter out a lot of the noise if you will of the other senses and there's a lot to be said to skillfully opening that lens of awareness of all these sense doors um to brighten up our curiosity especially if we find like we're in a routine we're not really paying attention to what is beautiful um who was it that said that there was a beautiful quote um not sure if i wrote it down but hmm maybe i didn't um So it's really um, also the you know this uh, this language of looking is different than attending. So attending can be through any of our sense doors to really be turning up the dial to attending to our life as it's unfolding, which yeah, investigating what we think is ordinary. Like, <laughs> if you notice the thoughts of boredom, that you think, you know, something is boring or my life is boring or I'm stuck in a rut or something like, hmm, are we really paying attention? Can we just turn up that dial a little more? And uh, one of the things I've been doing lately is just trying to, it sounds mundane, but it does help wake you up sitting in different places, using a different hand, non-dominant hand. Right now I've tucked my dominant hand under, so I won't be using it so much. Uh, and um, yeah, simple things that can just help you to pay attention a little more to the routines of even where I, where I sit at the table or, um, where I sit in the living room, just changing it up. Uh, where I park in habitual places, et cetera. Uh, because it's really um, just a slight, it doesn't take a lot of effort, a slight redirection can be enough to counter the trance of habit the phrase living in absentia came up today in my, my notes and the musings of the mind. It, I've probably heard it elsewhere before, so I can't give credit, but because I'm not sure where from. Uh, living in absentia, kind of like, are we absent from our own lives? Hmm. Um, an author, Annie Dillard, says, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. You know, so how was today? How was this day? How are the days? Because this is our life. And the same can be said for any moment. If there, if there seems like there's a sameness to them. Uh, just letting some folks in here. So uh, 
Um, in the interview between these two authors, um, the author of the blog and, and the author of the book, one of them mentioned this kind of a sense of the Russian nesting dolls, you know, the, there's a little wooden figure and then one outside of it holding the little one and they open up and they get bigger and bigger and nesting inside each other. Um, and and um, I think it was Alexandra Horowitz that said, but there's no limit to the the biggest doll or the outer form the out, there's no outer limit you can just keep expanding 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 that attention likewise we can really uh, take the attention in and in and in and small and detailed and um, um, molecular so I often think of it like a flashlight that has an end that you can turn so you can turn it into a quite a narrow beam to focus on something or you can really turn it the other direction so it becomes a wide and diffuse beam of attention uh, and this is a helpful skill to have in our meditation both are very important to be able to tighten up the lens of awareness to a single object and really mm, turn up the curiosity with that one-pointedness and it can be equally important and skillful to practice opening that lens of awareness to include a, a wider field of awareness so that's what we're going to practice with tonight um, in terms of not knowing until we get there uh gil fronsdale a uh, beloved dharma teacher uh, says it this way a simple but profound way to practice not knowing is to add i don't know to every thought <laughs> that's awesome every thought i don't know i i mean I certainly have a lot of ideas about what I think I know, especially about how I want things to be. And uh, it's very liberating to practice in this way. Hmm, I don't know. Uh, he goes on to say, this is the most, uh, this is most effective in meditation when the mind has quieted down. So quieting the mind down can be helpful first before we, open it up um, he says so for example if the judgment arises this is a good meditation session or this is a bad meditation session respond with I don't know uh, follow the thought I can't manage this or I need or I am with I don't know like the bumper sticker that says question authority, the phrase, I don't know, questions the, thor the authority of everything we think. And as my friend said this morning, not knowing where I'm going until I get there. So beautiful. Hmm. Yeah. So I think that's it for tonight. A shorter talk. I did it. <laughs> shorter by five minutes, not much, but baby steps. <laughs> so let's have a practice of awakening and um, not knowing. So adjust your posture, your lighting, find a posture that is conducive to wakefulness um, and also ease. So you um, you want to feel supported um, whether you're standing reclining or walking or sitting you might like to turn away from the screen hmm.
And as you're settling and arriving, give yourself time to mm, attend to before you quickly bring yourself into stillness. See if you need any movement or touch or massage or turning, any other adjustments. Mm. So that when you come into stillness, it feels like um, mm, an easeful settling and resting, not a any anything forceful. <clears throat> I have lots uh, to work with if the other sense doors uh, where I'm staying here in Toronto. The window is open and there's lots of scents and sounds and uh, different experiences than what I'm used to. So I'm in a very different environment than my normal one. So it's uh, it's good fodder for practice here. Mm. So you might you might consider if you have a usual place for practicing or a usual place for sitting or eating or whatever that uh, what's it like to shake that up and change it up. There can be a lot of also skillfulness in just having a regular place where you just sit down and rest. So both are important. So as you're ready now coming to just rest in stillness, a stillness where softness can, can meet us. And as Gil reminds us, this is most effective practicing not knowing when the mind has quieted down. So we'll begin with that. what is helpful for you what supports you in arriving and settling Softening any tension that isn't helpful right now. And to help invite some quieting, arriving, settling, we'll begin with uh, attending to an anchor. So it might be something simple like the sensation in your hands or feet, or if you prefer the breath.
Not to wrestle our attention or try and constrain it or force it, but a soft curiosity. To just really pay attention to that one place that you're settling. If the attention has pulled away to other thoughts and plans, imaginings, just gently begin again, feeling the sensations of that resting place that you chose without judgment. And as the author of this 11 Walks with Expert Eyes reminds us right now, we may be missing the vast majority of what's happening around us. The other events unfolding in our body, in the distance, and right in front of us. By gathering our attention as we began to an anchor, we excluded an unthinkably large amount of information from all of the other senses. And so now we'll gently begin including those curiosities as if instead of walking around the block with 11 different beings, we're inviting these different curiosities to come and embody this moment with us. So 
So even if your eyes are closed or slightly open, becoming aware of this sense of light or darkness, or perhaps there's some brightness in one corner of the space that's sensed differently than another part of this seeing faculty, even with eyes closed or open slightly. What kind of ambient sounds are in the room that you're in? There may be subtle hums that seem more continuous and maybe less noticeable than other distinct sounds that stand out sounds of our bodies, sounds of appliances, And then we can open the lens of attending to the places that the body is touching, pressing, resting against the support that you're on, chair, the cushion, the ground, bench, whatever it is. Really noticing what's touching the legs, the back, feet, and where. Similarly, bringing curiosity and brightness to noticing the touch of clothing, pressure or texture. See if you can notice a sensation of contact in on a spot of the body that you don't usually attend to. Perhaps the inner elbow or the behind the ear.
the touch of the tongue or the teeth. The sensation of tension in a habit place, perhaps shoulders or jaw, fingers. As Horowitz calls it, the map of the cool and warm places on your body. And if your eyes are open, or you might choose to slightly open your eyes to let in the experience of the blurred view of our own peripheral vision, sense of space in the room of our own body. And similarly, the peripheral experience of hearing, letting it be a little wider if there's other sounds outside of your room.
And for these last five minutes of practice, we'll continue together in silence with that wide, receptive aliveness of not knowing where we're going until we get there, not knowing what sensations through all of these six sense doors are going to arise. French philosopher Simone Weil said, attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity.
So if you practiced with us here on this YouTube recording, thank you so much for being here. Check the links below. I'll link to this beautiful blog and um, and the book by Alexandra Horowitz. Um, and yeah, I think that was most of the things I was pointing to. Um, Seemed there was something else I was going to say, but it's gone. Um, yeah, so thanks for being here and hope to practice with you again.